Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another edition of our webinar series, Inside Immigration. Today, we are joined by panelists at Green and Spiegel, Khadija Malumalam and Alana Glenn. Please feel free to ask any questions via the pop-up text bar on the right side of your screen, and we will do our best to address them at the end of this presentation. The panelists do not get to your question. You can contact them through the information provided on screen. And with that being said, I'll pass things over to our panelists. Hi there, good afternoon. My name is Alana Glintz. I'm one of the senior associates here at Green and Spiegel. Uh, and this is my colleague, Khadija. Oh, hi. My name is Khadija. Um, and uh, yeah, we're happy to be speaking to you today. As you might have heard, there are many, many updates that Minister Fraser has um, given us, which is great news for us and for you. So um, Elena will get us started. All right, so I think we'll start with kind of our, um, our oldest update that we have. So this is from May 31st, and it's just with respect to the category-based selection under express entry. Um, so we knew uh, that this category-based selection was, was forthcoming, but we now have received a bit more clarity with respect to the specific occupations and the factors that are being considered. Um, so this year, the category-based selection invitations will focus on candidates who either, one, have a strong uh, French language proficiency, and when they say this, they mean a minimum score of seven in all four abilities, or uh, have work experience in one of the following fields. So the fields that have been identified are healthcare, STEM professions, trades, such as carpenters, plumbers, contractors, uh, transportation, and agriculture. So within these categories, there are specific occupations that have been identified. So if you have work experience under one of these occupations, then you could be eligible on, under one of the category-based selections. So we would suggest going uh, on uh, the website and double checking if your NOC code is there. So your national uh, occupational classification code that is associated with the occupation um, in which you have experience. And when we talk about experience, it's having at least six months of continuous work experience, whether it's in Canada or abroad during the last three years in any of those occupations listed. And that would make you eligible to potentially be uh, selected uh, through the, where the express entry draws. Now we have had some questions, you know, what does this mean for our regular kind of points draws that we're seeing? These aren't going away necessarily. Um, IRCC will still be holding those draws and even since the announcement we are continuing to see these draws, um, which could be, you know, individuals could be invited without reference to any of these categories. Um, and our upcoming draws could either include all pro program draws uh, or program specific. So we don't necessarily have a heads up on which it'll be. And we're still awaiting our first category uh, based selection draw. So that is expected to come probably later this summer. Um, I will, I guess, um, bounce off of what Alana just said. And um, the yesterday, the minister announced that um, the week of July 5th, there will actually be a category-based um, draw for the STEM professionals. So that is something that's pretty exciting, especially if you are part of that group of individuals. Um, and if you know someone that is, then they should probably put their update their profile because um, that's coming very soon. July 5th is next week. And that's my first update. You can go ahead, Elena. <laughs> okay, so um, moving over to a different topic, we have the electronic travel authorization expansion. So some other exciting news, this was um, uh, beginning of June that it was announced. So the addition of 13 uh, additional countries that are eligible to use the ETA program. So this refers to um, travelers seeking to visit uh, from these 13 countries who have either held a Canadian visa in the last 10 years or who currently hold uh, a valid um, non-immigrant visa in the United States, um, who can now apply for an ETA if they're looking to travel to Canada by air. 
So previously, these individuals would have required a visa, um, but if they fall under one of those categories, meaning they've held the visa within the last 10 years or they hold a U.S. visa, um, then they can utilize an ETA to travel by air, which is great. Um, the key here, though, is that they are coming to visit. So if it is someone who is planning to come here and apply for a work permit, it is still advisable that they apply for their work permit from outside Canada um, and immigration will process it out at a consular level. Um, so these individuals wouldn't be eligible to come in if they're planning to work. So uh, we would suggest consulting with us prior to um, pursuing the ETA if you're unsure whether or not you qualify. Um, the countries that have been added, I'll, I'll walk through them. Um, it's Antigua. It is here. Argentina, Costa Rica, Morocco, Panama, Philippines, St. Kitts and uh, Nevis. St. Lucia, St. Vincent, uh, and the Grenadines, Seychelles, uh, Thailand, Trinidad and Tobago, and Uruguay. So great additions. Um, so if you are uh, from one of those countries looking to visit and you've held a visa or hold a U.S. visa, then it's something to consider. Um, if you already have a valid Canadian visa, you can still continue to utilize that. So that doesn't change. Um, and if you are traveling by other means outside of air, then you would also still require a, a visa to travel to Canada. That's the ETA update. Okay, hey, um, switching gears just a little bit, uh, talk going from visitors to refugees. Um, on June 12th, uh, the minister announced a new program for, well, a revamped program. The program already existed. It's the Economic Mobility Pilot Program, which is for skilled refugees. Um, and previously, the way the program worked, uh, the person would have to get a be nominated by a province and then continue through the process. Um, now, the, the program, um, it's a little bit more uh, streamlined. There is still a provincial nominee uh, stream um, but then there's also two others where you can have a job offer in Canada and that can qualify you uh, to apply through the um, EMPP program or for the EMPP program the pathway does lead to permanent residence and uh, the minister said that processing time could be as little as six months which is really fantastic especially for refugees um, the EMPP program the thing that hasn't changed is, is that the person does have to be um, outside of the country that they are claiming to be to be facing persecution from. Um, uh, but it is an it is a really good pathway that um, exists, and um, it could be something that is an option for uh, displaced people um, who are outside of their home country and who have job experience in any of the MAC codes. Um, and for one of the streams, it's at any time. It's not even a time period. The only limitation is that there is a language requirement for any of the pathways, the EMPP pathways, whether it's through the provincial nominee or the other, the other side. Um, so though the job requirements are more lenient, um, any NOC, any time, uh, the language requirements are there and could be a barrier. So that's something to look at. Um, for the you know, previous NOC 5 tier uh, 5 category, um, the lowest score um, is a 4 on the language uh, test. So um, some, some language requirement is, is uh, needed. And that's the EMPP update. Okay, uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, we do have some uh, temporary measures that have been set in place for individuals affected by the wildfires in Canada. Um, so as of June 12th, IRCC announced these special measures um, and it's meant to uh, assist those who have been impacted by the wildfires who need replacement documents or who are extending or restoring their status. So um, IRCC has announced that it will issue uh, free replacement documents for Canadians, permanent residents, and temporary residents who are directly affected by the wildfires. So this would include things like permanent resident cards, um, citizenship certificates, passports, or other travel documents which have been lost or damaged or whatnot um, due to the 
wildfires. So um, international students, temporary foreign workers, and other visitors who have been affected and whose status will expire by September 30th of 2023 um, will also be eligible to apply, restore, or extend their status free of charge. So essentially, this means on a practical level, um, temporary workers who are unable to work because their workplace was closed, for example, due to the wildfires, um, they'll be able to extend and, and stay until their workplace reopens. Um, same goes for students uh, without penalty. And these measures are in place until September 30th of this year. Okay. Um, I think we all heard about uh, the students, the international students who are facing uh, deport, possibly facing deportation from Canada due to the fact that their study permits were um, issued fraudulently um, or using fraudulent documents to obtain the study permit. Um, so on June 14th, uh, the minister announced um, some some relief uh, to the to to that. Uh, Basically, now the students' uh, cases will be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis, and if there is um, evidence that the student um, came to can Canada with a genuine intent to study and without uh, knowledge of the use of the fraudulent documentation, um, then it's possible that they could be issued a temporary resident permit, um, and so that, that will ensure that some of these international students um, can remain in Canada um, and will not face deportation, will not face a five-year ban from re-entering Canada. Um, and that's a positive step in that um, realm because there were a lot of international students who could have really been affected. Um, that being said, one of the first uh, hearings that was held for one of the students um, who seemed to have a genuine intent, um, they were found to be inadmissible. So. Um, while this pathway does, or not pathway, while while these cases are being reviewed, um, it's going to take a little bit of, uh, um, you know, they, the, the students might face refusal at the first instance, um, but these challenges can go on uh, to the federal court who can possibly overturn those. So if you know any students that are being, that are being affected by this, um, we can help them. Um, but also let them know, you know, not to give up because um, they were victims of fraud and they should make sure their case is being presented as such because um, there are instructions from the minister and that together with some good representation should go a long way. Back to you. Um, I guess on the same uh, line of students, there's a, another temporary policy that was announced uh, yesterday. Um, that allows um, workers to study in Canada without a study permit. So it's meant to allow uh, workers in Canada to uh, upgrade their skills, et cetera, without having to uh, you know, apply for and obtain a study permit. Um, so to be eligible, you must either hold a valid work permit um, and the application for that work permit must have been received before June 7th, 2023 or you have to have submitted a, an extension application for your work permit uh, prior to June 7th, and meaning you're on maintained status still in Canada pursuant to that pending extension application. Um, so uh, the, the exemption to this uh, having to hold a, a study permit is going to remain granted um, and it will apply until the, either the work permit that you have expires, the extension that you have is refused, or the policy expires, whichever comes first. So this policy will take effect uh, yesterday, starting yesterday, and it will expire um, on June 27th, 2026. So um, it's, a, it's a nice um, option for individuals for those workers who also wish to stay. Okay, and um, I'm going back to uh, refugees. Um, on June 16th, the Supreme Court, of, so um, refugees that Enter, can, enter the U.S. first are expected to make a refugee claim in the U.S. first, um, unless they have immediate family in Canada, brother, sister, mom, dad, uncle, aunt, um, grandparent. Um, 
but and there was a challenge that was brought to that the fact that if you enter the US first, unless you have an immediate family member in Canada, you cannot come to Canada and make a refugee claim, even if you haven't made a claim in the US first. Um, that that um, agreement between Canada and the US is called the Safe Third Country Agreement. Um, there was a constitutional challenge that was brought by members of the, pub, of the private bar because the US is um, very unfriendly to people making refugee claims. And sometimes um, given, you know, just geography, it's easier for people to get to the US first than it is to get to Canada. Um, and it's easier to get to Canada by foot from the US than it is to get to Canada um, any other way. And because of that, uh, the constitutional challenge to this agreement was brought. Um, but uh, on June 16th, the Supreme Court of Canada upheld the agreement. So that means that that agreement was seen to be constitutional, meaning that the agreement stands and that unless you have immediate family in Canada, if you enter the US first, you have to make a refugee claim in the US. You will not be allowed to come to Canada um, to make a refugee claim, um, you know, no matter what your circumstances, unfortunately. So um, that is the update to that. I see a question in the question box. Um, someone's mentioning they're having issues um, with the audio. Oh. Uh, Diana. Are you able to confirm if you can hear us? I can hear you, Elena. <laughs> I can Hi, you. yes, Elena, I can hear you as well. Oh, okay. perfect. Maybe that was just that individual. Diana, are you able to put um, some text in, like in like a chat um, that goes out to the um, participants just sure. to confirm that if anyone else can't hear to let us know. Sure. Let Maybe me see one um, what I can do. Okay. I, I'll continue on um, just in the interest of time. Um, we are just heading into our last topic. So if you do have any questions, feel free to um, add them to the question box and we will uh, endeavor to get to those at the end of the session. Um, so our last topic is on the Francophone Mobility Program and the expansions of that program, which is very exciting. So just generally speaking, the Francophone Mobility Program is a, a work permit category um, that is available for French-speaking individuals with a job offer from a Canadian employer who are destined to work in a province outside of Quebec. So if you're working in Quebec, you can't use the, the Francophone Mobility Program. It has to be for a, a province outside of Quebec. So it's a really great category for work permits because essentially the only requirement has traditionally been, you know, you must speak French and you must work within a skilled role. Well, that's been expanded further. Um, so not only, you know, having a, a you know, a French uh, language ability, but also it's been expanded to all skill levels. So all national occupational classification codes, all not codes are eligible now to apply uh, under the mobility program. Um, apart from jobs in primary agriculture. And they've also expanded eligibility for the French speaking ability. So um, it's now a moderate French language proficiency that's required, which means level level five in a language test, um, which is kind of traditionally a bit lower than what we would have um, uh, expected under that, that category. So it's a great addition um, and you would if you're applying under this category, you would be expected to demonstrate proof of your language ability. So whether that's a language test that you've taken and the results showing that you've met um, the minimum score of five, um, diploma or a degree from a French college university or other proof that you would study at, at a post-secondary level in the French language, and those could be used as, as proof. Um, these expansions with respect to the NOT codes and, and the level of French required are going to last for the next two years. So uh, we would encourage um, individuals and employers to take advantage of that. It's not necessary that the individual um, be speaking French in their anticipated role in Canada. It's more about does that person have that ability to speak French in general. Um, so great option, but as always, please set up a consultation with us. We're happy to walk you through it and advise whether you're eligible under that category. 
don't I have see any more. other questions at this point. We'll give you a moment um, if you have any you'd like to add to the box. Khadija, anything else uh, on your side in terms of updates? No, those were all the updates. Surprisingly, we got through them, given that yeah. there were so many. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, um, if there isn't anything further, again, feel free to reach out. We're always happy to have a consultation to discuss um, any any matter that you have. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's it on our side. Diana, over to you. Amazing, thank you. So that's all the time we have for today, folks. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, and a special thanks to Khadija and Alana for sharing their expert knowledge. If you'd like to discuss today's topics in more detail, like Alana stated, please reach out to both the consultation. Details can be found on the screen as of now. And I encourage you all to sign up for our e-alerts and follow us on social media to keep up to date on the latest developments inside Canadian immigration. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Hi. There is just one question within oh. the question bar. Oh, that's, that's pretty. So the question is, what would be the breakdown of the express entry new provisions compared to the old one? That's a pretty, that would take us a long time to, that's like a comparator. Um, I think that's something we could go over in a consult. I mean, how would they split the category basis compared to the regular express entry? Um, well, you'd have to show that you qualify for those categories right under your knock right Elena yeah and I mean it's it's about showing that six months of work experience over the last three years in one of those national national occupational classification codes and I mean they could they would likely be asking for proof of the same in the same way that they do under the regular um kind of draws that we've been seeing in terms of letters from employers etc um, but yeah, we're, we'd be happy to, to break that down further in a consultation if there are specific questions about, um, you know, the, the, the basis um, under which they're doing the selections. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. I don't know how to get out. <laughs>